So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Stout. I'm the director of the Master of Arts program in Global Security Studies here at Johns Hopkins Krieger School of Advanced Academic Krieger School of Arts and Sciences Advanced Academic Programs. And I'm delighted that you've joined us this evening. And I'm also really happy that we're going to be hearing a talk this evening about, I think, a really, really interesting topic. Um, a lot of thought goes into the decision to go to war or equally important to, to not go to war. And a lot of thought, of course, goes into the actual conduct of wars, but not nearly so much goes of th thought goes into the termination of wars. How is this all going to end? And this is true, actually, not just of government and military leaders, but also true uh, among scholars. So to talk about that subject tonight, we have with us Dr. Uh, Robert Levine, Bob Levine. He teaches a course for us here at uh, Advanced Academic Programs called Assessing Foreign Militaries. Uh, that course is actually sponsored not by my program, but by the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis program. And I would like to take this moment to acknowledge Dr. Kevin Cross, who's with us this evening and who's the, the director of that program. Uh, I would add though, for, for people who might be in the Global Security Studies or indeed for that matter, other programs, this course though sponsored by Kevin's program is open across AAP. So, uh, so if you find this interesting, if you, uh, if you like hearing from Bob Levine, which you will, uh, I'd encourage you to, to, to look for his class in the coming semester. Um, so anyway, as I say, we're gonna be hearing uh, tonight from Bob Levine. Uh, Dr. Levine worked in the U.S. intelligence community for something north of 33 years, most of that at the CIA. Uh, initially, he was a military analyst uh, working on the Soviet War and Warsaw Pact and then successor, successor states, national security policies, their threat assessments, their military planning, both on the conventional and on the nuclear side. Uh, later on, he worked South Asian national security policies at CIA. And indeed he was the senior military analyst covering regional reactions to the 9-11 attacks and then all the, the wars uh, that followed from that. Along the way, he's had a chance to do uh, a, a whole slew of really interesting and fun things, including writing the first book length study of NATO command post exercises, which you can't read because it's classified, but I'm sure it's fascinating. Uh, he was also the director of central intelligence representative at the National War College, uh, where he taught courses as a professional, uh, as a professor of national security and strategy. And he has also been the director of military analytic training at the Sherman Kent School, which is the component of CIA where they train and educate intelligence analysts. And finally, let me just say that Dr. Levine holds a PhD in public policy analysis from the Rand Graduate Institute. It is a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to do this. I want to start with the mea culpa. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I was a military analyst for decades. Um, I was a professor at the National War College. I taught military analysis. And until I started preparing this talk, I would say I spent perhaps five hours dealing with the subject in total. And if that were the whole story, you would have good reason to click. I'm out of this talk. <laughs> what am I going to hear? But the fact is, I'm an extremely good company. Uh, Mark mentioned that academics don't look at it. The fact is, senior military officers, senior policy academics, analysts pay far, far less attention to how wars end than how they begin and how they conduct. Um, Freddie Clay, who was an undersecretary of defense for policy in the Reagan years, uh, pointed this out, that we, we just have to take so little account of how wars are going to end, as important as that is. And if you look at our history and the wars we fought in, plus a lot of other wars, this theme comes through over and over and over again. When Japan attacked in 1941, they did not know how that war was even supposed to end. When the United Kingdom, France, invaded Egypt in 1956, they hoped Nasser would be overthrown, but they really had no notion of how the war would end. Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, no idea how the war would end. Uh, the United States and Vietnam, the United States and Korea, Israel in 1967, this is the Six Day War, which people think of, well, there's a great success story, okay? They did not make a political decision to go to the canal. That was simply a military event. They did not know how, how the war would end. 1973, um, they did not know the, the, both the Egyptians and the Syrians had no clear concept of how the war was supposed to end, unless it was just a miraculous. 
I have a, a fortunate coincidence that as a friend of mine served in the White House on three different tours. And I was talking to him about this issue. And he told me a great firsthand story about the invasion of Grenada. Some of you may remember, in 1983, Reagan authorized the first use of military force in Vietnam. The, uh, we had a number of medical students who were being held hostage in Grenada, and, he, and there was going to be an operation. So my friend was in the White House situation room when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, John Vesey, General Vesey, asked the president, uh, let me just say, what do you want to do about Grenada? What are my orders? The president pulled out a piece of White House stationery and picked up the pen and wrote down the following. And I want to read these to you because these are the actual words he wrote. Rescue, and he numbered them. One, rescue the American citizens. Two, secure the island. Three, change the government. And four, use whatever force is necessary to accomplish these objectives. And here's the telling part. We will worry about what to do about the island later. I think that's really quite good. That if that were unusual, that we'll worry about what happens later, that would be one thing. But this is the story that we see over and over again. The late Tony Shinella, who was a wonderful analyst who died not long ago, wrote a book for Brookings called Bombing or Bombs Without Boots. It's all about interventions where air power is trying to bring about victory, where there's no ground force or a very small ground force involved. And what he looks like in case after case are examples where it's not simply a lack of means to end the war, but a lack of failure to conceptualize how they intended to end the war. He looks at Bosnia, Kosovo, two campaigns he was deeply involved with, the Israeli operation against Hezbollah in 2006. And then one after another, each of these was supposed to be three or four days of bombing, the war's gonna be over. How's it gonna be over? What brings about a conclusion? And there was basically no thought given in any of these cases how the war is actually going to be terminated. Our country, since the year 2000, has had at least three major occasions where we've intervened, overthrown governments, and had no idea how to do it, and no planning. In 2001, very few people objected to the idea of overthrowing the Taliban, but the reality is we did not have any good concepts. And I want to give you a, an example of what, what we saw at the time. This is from a memo that Doug Fife, who was um, Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, wrote to Rumsfeld. Notice, Washington should not allow concerns about stability to paralyze U.S. efforts to oust the Taliban leadership. Nation building is not our key strategic goal. It wasn't simply not our goal. We had no good idea about how it was supposed to be brought about. Um, I was either fortunate or unfortunate enough to be involved in a number of discussions after 9-11 uh, at the White House on these issues. And I can tell you that was absolutely in keeping with everything I saw in the discussions. The, um, it wasn't just that. In the case of Iraq, not long afterwards, um, there was no real concept of how we were going to bring about some kind of final situation that would be satisfactory. People talk about, well, what was the phase four planning? And let me show you what that, what that involved. Phase one was, uh, phase zero is supposed to be shaping it and then it's deterring action. Phase two would be seizing initiative. Phase three is this major war. Phase four is supposed to be stabilizing. We ended the efforts to study the phase four operations before we even began the war. So in case after case, We've had this situation where we just didn't deal with it. And the first official we put in charge of Iraqi reconstruction after the end of major operations, Jay Garner, really summed up the thinking in a way that's quite sobering. It was stand up a government in Iraq and get out as fast as we can. Garner was succeeded by a man named, a man named Paul Bremer, a man President Bush had never met, who was not an expert on Iraq or post-conflict reconstruction and did not in fact speak Arabic. Bremer decided to purge members of Saddam's Ba'ath Party uh, and disband the Iraqi army, therefore creating a massive unemployed, resentful, armed men 
furthering the spiral into instability. Or instability. That sounds pretty, pretty condemning. But it doesn't stop there. President Obama was elected largely on a no more rocks platform. And yet, under his watch, we have a, uh, an intervention in Libya that follows the same pattern we've seen before. In an interview, it's a Fox News interview, actually, President Obama was asked, what was his worst mistake? It sounds like a gotcha kind of question, but it was an honest question. And his answer was very interesting. He said, probably failing to plan for the day after what I think was the right thing to do in intervening in Libya. In other words, we intervened without a good concept of what was going to happen. We intervened because we feared that civilians in Benghazi were threatened by the government who were going to be killed. But the objective, the objective soon switched to expanding, uh, expanding to, to topple Gaddafi. And we had nothing to go along with that. This is a litany of woe. It is a case that, as again, Freddie Clay wrote, and I think it's a, it's a great example of his boiling down the issue. He said, for any war effort, offensive or defensive, that's supposed to serve long-term national interests, the most essential question is how the enemy might be forced to surrender, or failing that, what sort of bargain might be struck with him to terminate the war? That's strategic thinking at its highest level, and it's the thing we simply don't do much of. Now, as I was looking at this, I came across a British document. This was a um, House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee report called Libya, Examination of Intervention and Collapse and the UK's Future Policy Options. And in testimony, Liam Fox, who had been the Secretary of State for Defense at the time of the Libyan intervention, said, look, we've got strategic criteria for the UK participation in any military intervention. And these are the four he said. So the first one is, what does a good outcome look like? Okay, that's pretty reasonable. He said, but that's not enough. That's the one people focus on, but this, but it's, is that outcome engineerable? Do we want, do we have to be a part of that? And how much of the aftermath do we want to own? That is the British want to own. What he said was that it's much easier to focus on the first question and ignore the next ones. And in the case of Libya, very explicitly he said, the answer to number one initially was civilian protection. That was in February, 2011. And he said they had plausible answers to number two, three, and four. But the objective changed. It changed from protecting civilians to regime change. And when it changed, they said, and the not only the chief of defense staff, but the chief, uh, I mean, not only uh, Liam uh, Fox, the secretary of state for the chief of defense staff, said they simply didn't address numbers two through four at that point. So, how are we going to explore this? I think the best way to look at this is to take a case study, and we're going to use the Treaty of Versailles that brought an end to the, to the First World War because it's well documented and it shows just what kinds of issues go into planning the, the end of a war. And I'd like to give you a quote from uh, Williamson Murray's chapter on the subject that I think really does a nice job of describing it. Now, this is a hideous sentence. This is a single sentence with far too many words, but I'm going to read it to you so we just track it because we're going to take this apart. <clears throat> it says, this chapter more or less argues that the nature of the war, its extraordinary length, its cost in lives and damage, the fury with which the contending powers waged it, the emergence of popular opinion as a major factor in international relations, and perhaps most important, the manner in which the conflict came to a sudden and unexpected end in November 1918. All of these factors ensured that there could not be a satisfactory peace because of the context that already laid out the direction of future events. So that's a pretty big uh, mouthful. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna break that apart and look at the pieces. And first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the outbreak of the war. A couple of years ago, 
the world observe the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War. In 2014, there was a veritable tsunami of publications about the beginning of the war, its causes and its outbreak. And we're, we're going to start with that because it is critical. We have to bury some myths about how the war started because that the reality is what affected the peacemaking at the end of the war. The war did not start because of a machine-like mechanism of alliances and timetables for mobilization. Some of the early histories said that, even some of the later histories, they're wrong. It did not start as a result of accident. The war did not start because of misperception and miscalculation. It began because of the aggressive intentions and actions of leaders in Vienna and especially Berlin. Leaders in Vienna trying to settle their complex multi-ethnic problems, especially the Slavs and the Balkans, sought a solution to a Balkan war. There would not have been a world war, or even a large European war, but for Germany's action. Germany underwrote a blank check to Vienna to carry out the initial war, and then going far beyond that, they ordered a national mobilization and an unprovoked aggressive war against France, including the invasion of Belgium, a neutral country that Germany had guaranteed and then declared that guarantee to be a mere scrap of paper. This was no defensive war, nor was it a war of revenge. Germany, in fact, had beaten France in 1870-71, imposed a large indemnity, that is reparations, something we'll hear about again, and taken over two major provinces, Alsace, Alsace and Lorraine. Germany sought to invade and defeat France and at a minimum, destroy its military and at a minimum, seize and incorporate Belgium. That is the country that European powers had to make peace with after November 1918. To use a, a, a phrase that's probably one that whose origins may, we may not like, there were not very fine people on both sides. So if that's the case, then we've got to go beyond the issue of how the war broke out, but the conduct of the, um, of the war. And when we, when we talk about the conduct of the war, there are really two parts. Um, the first one is the violence of the German. We're not talking about how they conducted operations in the field, but rather how do they actually behave in terms of what they did with the populations. And I wanna start by showing an image of a, a beautiful city in southern Belgium. This is the city of Dinan. I spent a year in Belgium. This is one of my favorite cities. It's on the Meuse River. It's a beautiful place. It is very hard for me to go there because I think when I've been there multiple times of the 674 Belgians, civilians who were killed by the Germans there. The Germans in fact killed several thousand, about 6,000 Belgians and then almost 18,000 Belgians died during expulsions, deportations, imprisonments, and death sentences by courts. 120,000 Belgians were forced laborers by the Germans. Half of them deported to Germany. This is a picture of the University of Leuven or Leuven. The Germans purposely destroyed one of the oldest libraries in Europe and vastest collections. This was not a peaceful war that was antiseptic. This is a war that in fact killed innocents on a massive scale. That's the violence level, but even in the conduct of war, the Germans broke the bounds of anything the allies had seen before. They initiated the use of poison gas. They bombed London. They shelled Paris. They built special artillery they could bring to lob massive shells into Paris. They conducted unrestricted submarine warfare. And I don't know if any of you have seen the, the movie 1917. If you haven't, I strongly commend it. But it in fact sets as a premise the notion of the withdrawal in 1917 of the Germans back to a defensive line called the Hindenburg Line. As they withdrew, they destroyed everything they could in their path. So 
that again, just as with the, the beginning, the outbreak of the war, the violence of the war, the conduct of the war, the allies are facing uh, a country that very hard for them to, to think about. This is what Ypres looked like in 1917. And then we have to talk about what were some of the emotional aspects. This is Dumont ossuary. It is at the site of the battlefield of Verdun. Inside that building are the skeletal remains of 130,000 soldiers who were killed nearby. You can see the bones and skulls. This is something that ate deep into the French conscious and we're gonna get more into that. But the other thing we have to talk about is the last eight months or so of the war. And the thing I wanna focus on is what happened on the Eastern front, not the Western front because Germany was waging a war, not simply against France and Belgium and Britain, later the United States, but against the Russians. And in, on the 3rd of March, 1918, they forced a peace on the Russians. And the nature of that peace tells you what, again, what the Allies thought they had. This is a map that shows just part of the territory that was taken over that the Germans demanded as a result of signing that peace treaty. The Russians had to give up one third of their entire population. 89% of all the coal fields in Russia were given, had to be given up. And this map, by the way, doesn't show all the territory. The Russians were forced to surrender 1 million square miles of territory. Now, that's pretty hard to imagine. What's a million square miles? But let me name a few countries. The United Kingdom, France, Spain, Germany, Italy, Poland, if you take the territory and put all of them together, that's less than a million square miles. So if those are the kinds of demands Germany put, and then the war finally comes to an end, and it comes to the making of the peace, what were the issues involved in, in trying to, to reach peace? The first thing is there was a sudden ending to the war. No one had planned on the war coming to a close that quickly, neither the Allies nor the Germans. And Sally Marx, who's a major historian in the field, says the Germans never really absorbed the notion it had lost. Because when the war ended, if you look at the dotted line on that map, they were sitting in Belgium and in France, not in Germany. The initial agreement was for an armistice, not a German surrender. It was a, more like a ceasefire. But the biggest issue of all had to do with the tensions and disagreements among the allies and then the negotiations. And this is what we need to spend a little time on. The differences in views among the different allied players, we may think of the Entente or the Western Alliance kind of like we thought of World War II, but in fact, there were terrible disagreements. In the United States, Woodrow Wilson, thought that the United States' financial and commercial preponderance, its position as the largest world power, largely unscathed from the war, would give it leverage over its allies, not just its belligerents. And what did the United States want? This is a description that Eikenberry has described, and I, I think it's excellent. The United States looked for open diplomacy, disarmament, freedom of the seas, removal of trade barriers, that self-determination of minorities and restraints on reparations and so on. That's what the, they thought about. But what did the allies who fought the war for those four terrible years think? One is they looked at their losses. France lost 1.3 million soldiers and civilians. And look at the UK losses, 750,000, 460,000 for Italy, the US 117,000, but those numbers as large as they are, let's put it in perspective. France had a population of about 40 million. That means today, if the United States were to lose the same kind of numbers that France lost, we would have over 10 million dead. The United States lost 1 25th of its, of, compared to France's population in proportion. So when the European allies saw this, they said, why do we think they paid the price that we have paid? And on a narrower personal level, 
we have to think about that because the leaders of these countries made a difference. And I pulled out some of the British leaders because I thought they were good examples. Prime Minister Asquith, the Foreign Secretary Gray, two future prime ministers, and Roger Kipling as a good example of, you know, the kind of elite of, uh, of the British population. Here's what they lost. Asquith lost a son in war. Gray had no sons, but he had a nephew he considered like a son, he's killed. The future prime ministers, Boner Law lost two sons, Anthony Eden, two brothers, Rudyard Kipling, his son. When we look, and I, I know the sounds elitist groups are talking about the very top of society, but the fact of the matter is they lost 19 members of parliament and 24 members of the House of Lords. Just by the end of 1915, nine peers and 95 sons of peers had been killed. What did they fear? They feared German domination and American abandonment. France in particular wanted some sense of not having a victory that, that did not justify the losses they had. They were afraid, they wanted to, to have dismemberment, reparations, and disarmament. Those were the things that could provide them with security. In the case of Italy, the same thing, they lost hundreds of thousands of people, they said, what did we fight this war for? And they also illustrate an excellent point, and that is that the domestic audience really mattered. There was a, 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 an emerging fascist party that in fact was able to depose the prime minister and he never was there for the signing of the treaty. He was already out of power. So we may look at it as old diplomacy, secret negotiation treaties. They looked at it as a search for security. The contrast between the Wilsonian view and the European view could not be more stark but there's a great line in the documentary summed it up. During the treaty negotiations, many of the leaders took time out to go to the front line to see how close it was to Paris and to see what it had looked like. Wilson refused to go. And his words tell the entire story. He said, peace must not be made with emotion. How can you not make peace with emotion? The brutal reality is the US had lost leverage. It lost leverage because during the war, it was a fight of financial importance. It provided manpower, it provided forces. At the end of the war, that's a different story. And the Europeans were fully aware of the domestic opposition, Wilson's stubbornness, and the basic disinterest the US had in being involved in European, in European issues. There were also inherent contradictions that were critical in the uh, Wilsonian view. So here's a map of Europe. Let me uh, show you three different places within that map. The Sudeten Germans. At the end of the war, Czechoslovakia lobbied for and was created as an independent country. One of the most liberal countries in all of Europe in the interwar years. They had a problem. The Sudeten Germans were a population who wanted to be part of Germany, but in fact, because they sat in vital territory to be able to protect Prague were handed over to Czechoslovakia. This is the kind of problem that Wilson's notions of ethnic groups should be able to have their own self-determination fell apart. You either have a secure situation or you allow them to do that. The same thing with Austria. The Austrian population wanted to be part of Germany. The Germans wanted them. If they had, Germany would have been even stronger. The Polish corridor was carved out to give Poland access to the water, to the sea. But by doing that, it interfered with the population, which was in fact Prussian. And these areas, these contentious fights were not only over Europe. In China, one city of over a population of over a million was handed off to the Japanese. The Chinese, in fact, walked on the treaty and would not sign it. Africa, the Pacific Islands of the German, the Middle East, the maps were redrawn everywhere. And in almost all cases, they violated the principles, these Wilsonian principles. We've got a problem here, and that is the negotiations could not lead to a, a reasonable end. But even after the treaties were signed, there were other problems that cropped up. The Allies forced the Germans, I mean, I'm sorry, they failed to force the Germans to live up to the restrictions of the treaties. 
The Germans were banned from having a general staff. They were banned from having tanks, aircraft, poison gas. They created a general staff and named it something else, Truppenmann. They cooperated with the Russians to have tanks, aircraft, poison gas. This is being to mention the unlawful arms dumps they had, the failure to correct reparations, to keep the Wineland in their lives, and so on. Probably before we have this talk, you may have heard the famous John Maynard Keynes line about we created the seeds for a future war. The reality is, as Rick Murray said, this was a piece that could not be lasted. I want to close, because I need to bring this close so we can talk about your questions, with the issue of, so is there a broader picture to this? And I think there is. Dan Ryder has written about how wars end, saying, look, one, two of the big drivers are the uncertainty and incomplete, incomplete information in war and commitment. The incomplete information is when countries go to war, they don't know how things are going to turn out. And therefore, battles actually help determine what's going to happen. They don't know ahead of time. But even more important is this notion of commitment. If you try to reach an agreement with another country, can you make sure that they will adhere to it? Or in fact, Will they back away later? And that fear of commitment, the fear of the other side not adhering to commitments leads countries to propel towards a more vicious fight, not an easier one. The last thing I wanna bring up is the whole issue of, so where does that bring us to today? This is a quote from a document, a formerly top secret document that talked about, well, what if there were a nuclear war? And I think it's incredibly revealing that even when we get to this potentially cataclysmic state, this is the kind of thing that can be written in official levels. The United States might, in that extremity, that's a massive war, resort to actions unimaginable to us today. Actions we might now label as defeatism, imperialism, or even barbarism might seem quite reasonable. Think about it. This is a document that said mass extermination of the remaining populations of the communist countries with biological and chemical weapons might seem justified to guarantee the territorial integrity of their neighbors against incursions. War has a self-propelling mechanism to make it more and more violent. There are certainly ways to pull it back and to try to deal with that. But the reality is it's awfully hard to keep a war from, from escalating to terrible levels. And what I'd like to do is, I'd like to end with a quote that Secretary of Defense Robert Gates kept at his desk. He mentions this in his book, Duty. It's a quote from Churchill, and I think it really sums up the answer to the question about why don't we study how wars end, not just how they begin or they commence. Never, never believe any war will be smooth and easy. These are the words of Winston Churchill in 1942. Or that anyone can, who embarks on the strange voyage can measure the tides and hurricane he will encounter. The statesman who yields to war fever must realize that once the signal is given, he is no longer the master of policy, but the slave of unforeseeable and uncontrollable events. So I think there's actually an answer to the question. I'll give it to you because I kind of always had a problem with questions, talks, papers that have a question no one answers. And so I'm gonna give you my soundbite. Here's my soundbite. War is an unpredictable interaction between countries, peoples, and leaders. It takes on a changing character, driven by passions such as fear and hatred and chance that cannot be foreseen when it starts. An early admission of its latent and inherent unpredictability and irrationality would undercut the very notion of using war as a tool of policy. Why we don't study it? Because it's just too painful. Thank you all for listening to this. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Um, I'm gonna assert the prerogative of the chair and ask the first uh, question, uh, maybe two, and, and Kevin, if you have any uh, questions as well. But in the meantime, just a reminder that for those of you uh, in the audience who have questions, <coughs> Feel free to click that Q&A button down in the bottom bottom middle of your screen there and type in your question, and I will uh, I will I will moderate.
as we go along. Um, so that's kind of a gloomy picture uh, you painted for us, Bob. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you have any, um, aside from the, um, you, you know, your conclusion, which was think super hard and probably don't do this at all. Uh, if you, for better or worse, that's not realistic for the United States, indeed for most countries. I think it's a safe prediction that there will be future wars. So um, taking that as a given, um, what kind of pres policy prescriptions would you have, or maybe policy prescriptions in the right way to frame it, but what should we do to make this situation less bad, to make our leaders think more about war termination, both going in and then along the way? It's a great question. So I've spent some time thinking about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think the most important thing is we need to honestly study it. And we're not studying it. When I first started working on this, a big part. <clears throat> I asked my colleagues with whom I taught at the War College, I said, do any of you remember talking about this at all in the War College? Every one of them said, no, shameful. Whether it's in academic programs, war colleges, intelligence agencies or wherever, the first thing we need to do is rigorously study. What are the issues that drive war to more extreme levels or that hold it back? There are things that can limit war. There are confidence building measures and others that can either perhaps not prevent, but bring wars to an end. But we seem to invent those anew every single time. It's like reinventing the wheel and every time saying, you think the wheel should be round this time? Well, we know some things at work and we know <clears throat> some of the problems. So I would say the very first step is we owe it to our future generations to study this far more seriously and rigorously than we do just the damn beginning and conduct of war. So that's absolutely the first stage. Justin has a question that was gonna be my second question if I needed to fill time by asking one, uh, he's asked it instead. Um, he asks, are there examples of states that have consistently planned how to end conflicts and done so well? Is it even possible to do so? Um, and if it's not possible, like, so then what? I know of no state that has a good record. None. I could name state after state after state that has a terrible record. And I know of none that consistently do it. Moreover, I know of none that study it. Mm -hmm. So when I was at the War College and in my intelligence world, I looked at how other states did their planning. I saw no evidence, none for any state I dealt with in consideration, in serious consideration how war termination was to occur. So if it exists, it's really well hidden. Um, so a, a question that uh, that uh, is a little out of order here, but I think is actually a good follow on to this that came in from Anna. Um, how would studying the end of war be implemented in the US defense structure? And as a practical matter, would it ever be able to compete against the intelligence focus and the research focus on the beginnings and on current pressing international crises? That's it. That's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, I had crafted some questions I was going to ask of people and that was one of them. Where should it be? How should we do it? It has to be incentivized by leaders that understand how terrible this is. A person like Robert Gates absolutely understood the issue, but he was swamped by the immediate the immediacy of his job of being Secretary of Defense. Um, some of the possibilities are to charge institutes that do research in the field to say, we need your work. Some of this can be contractual. What used to be the Office of Net Assessment, um, there's no reason for them not to pay for studies to look at war termination. There's no reason the Pentagon can't do it. Intelligence communities can do it but especially the academic world. I would say most of this is open information. There's nothing truly secret about it. So I think there's an enormous field that, that awaits people in security studies to look at this. Um, Scott asks, uh, you ended on a Clausewitzian note. So Scott asks a Clausewitzian question. Um, so sounds to him like you're doubting Clausewitz's logic uh, regarding war having a dual nature as being both sort of autonomous but also instrumental. Um, right. 
Well, Scott, you asked a great question. I, in fact, had several slides, which I didn't show because of timing, which talks about Clausewitz. Clausewitz talked about this remarkable trinity, the including um, the passion, the <clears throat> war is a matter of passion and, and so forth, war is a matter of chance, and war is a matter of government control. And he said, it's an interplay of these. But in fact, I think that this talk is in fact very Clausewitzy in the sense of at any given time, it's, and Clausewitz describes it as, a, as if a magnet suspended between three other magnets. You don't know how it's going to play out. But in fact, what we have to do is think about how war can be propelled by passion, by chance, and by command, and by trying to determine policy. So I think it's that second, it's that remarkable trinity that in fact Clausewitz was addressing it. Hugh Strawn, by the way, gave a talk a, a couple of months ago, uh, and I had the chance to ask him about the whole notion of what did Clausewitz have to say about uh, how wars end? And he said, you know, Clausewitz really looked at it from a very military level, which was he thought of as a climactic battle, mm -hmm. as in the Napoleonic Wars, it would bring a campaign to an end. Well, the kind of countries we've had since then, that just doesn't happen. It's not a single battle. That's why things like the campaigns in Kosovo and Bosnia in 2006 against Hezbollah failed. They thought they could pull it off, two or three days of bombing, the war's over. It doesn't happen anymore. What's the role here for the State Department? Um, Adam wonders if a shift in federal budget uh, and you know, money tends to draw attention and to generate clout and it's absence yeah. takes away clout. Could a shift in funding towards the State Department um, help ameliorate this situation? I think it could. State Department actually has direct sway over the Institute of Peace, um, which is created in order to study these kinds of issues. And I have seen virtually nothing come out. So could State Department do more with this? It could do more with what it already has. And I don't know anybody in the defense field who doesn't feel more money should be going to state because far more can be accomplished with diplomacy than with the extra cruise missiles or F-35s we buy. So yes, a, a shift is absolutely called for, but it's a shift in thinking as much as it is money or resources. Do you think that's there's any realistic prospect of that ever happening? I, I do not know. I mean, I, I think that President-elect Biden has picked good people, but I also know from my experience that as soon as senior policymakers are in a job, the immediate issues eat up their time. There's a, a famous graphic that President George Herbert Walker Bush released one day of his calendar to show people what his calendar was like. His time segments written in, typed in for his schedule, were 15 minute block. But in handwritten, it showed what the actual time was. Some of those were three minute blocks of activity. You don't think deeply in three minute blocks. So the what I think a thoughtful leaders can do is charge other people to start thinking about this seriously and then come to them with suggestions. They can't do it themselves. A couple of people have asked questions about the end of World War II. Yes. Uh, so how would you assess Yalta? Um, how would you assess the Marshall Plan and the European coal and steel community that eventually decades later evolved into the EU? I mean, isn't there a case to be made that while there was more than a little tragedy to the end of World War II as well, that by standards of some things that had gone on before, it was at least partially a success? That's an excellent point. And I agree. I agree completely with that. But think about what, how we waged that war. It was the unconditional surrender, occupation, total remaking of societies. What that is, is basically saying, I'm going to push this as far as it goes. We don't want every war to have to be like that. Wars with nuclear powers can't be like that anymore. So um, if you're willing to conquer the country, occupy it, spend forever there, we still have forces in Germany, um, we still have forces in Korea a long time after that, 
you can do some amazing things, but the commitment, the long-term commitment has to be there. And I'm not sure the United States is, is there anymore. The, the other thing about, as much as I admire the Marshall Plan and other things, those came years after the war ended. They were not in 1945. So when we're talking about actions that occurred in 1947, we first fumbled around. There's an excellent book, excellent book. And I believe I've got the title right. If you guys know, you correct me, please. I think it's called Savage Continent. Um, it's about Europe. And I, I'm very close to that title. It's uh, Europe in from 19, basically the end of the war. And anyone interested in the end of the war really has to read that book. There's a parallel book called I believe the vanquished on World War I, those two books should be required reading for anybody thinking about these issues. Stephen has a really interesting question that goes in a very different direction from what we've uh, been talking about. You, know, you, you talked about the horrible losses uh, that the countries involved, the belligerents involved in World War I suffered um, and how those weren't just abstract numbers. Uh, those were, you know, real people and the destruction of cultural artifacts and all this sort of stuff. And, and he wonders, um, is it possible to end wars in a just way? Is that a realistic goal? Or, or if we're going to end a war, are we going to have to suck up the fact that some people, some interests, some legitimate interests are not going to receive justice? That. Again, I think it's a wonderful true. question, Stephen. It's a wonderful <laughs> question. Um, well done. <laughs> yeah, it really is wonderful. So my own sense is- There's probably look, a, a semester long course in this. I'm sure there is. <laughs> my own brief sense is that there is never an ending of a war that isn't compromised. It's just in the nature of it. Unless, and even if you totally occupy, we occupied Japan, but we left Hirohito in charge. So even in, an, in, in a case where we had bombed 50 of the largest cities and used nuclear weapons, we still compromised in a sense how we would end that war. We compromised in the German sense, even after we occupy them and, and so on. I think it's always a compromise. So is it just, I think it's a compromised justice. If we're talking about a true pure justice, no, I don't believe that's likely at all. Um, Lewis, I just lost it here. Lewis asks, um, uh, Lewis is skeptical that, that, um, that the Defense Department um, can be counted on to do this sort of thinking and wonders about whether it should be explicitly uh, and publicly placed in the State Department and if that would do any good. It's sort of related to an earlier question we had. I see no reason why they both can't be involved. I spent three years at the National War College. They did some excellent work in phase four planning before the war in Iraq. The fact is um, Donald Rumsfeld and others shut down the effort. They have thought about those issues. They have think tanks. They have a think tank within National Defense University that can do that. So I wouldn't wanna close off people that have both knowledge and time and, and serious gravitas that can apply to it. Um, I think this is one of those cases where cooperative and even competitive studies would pay off. When we think about what goes into the cost of a war, it is so much cheaper to do anything, to come up with a better solution than with a better weapon system. This is a bargain. <laughs> um. Raquel asks about the psychology here. Um, and in particular, uh, she's asking about um, the mental strain that affects decisions made during war. And Clausewitz wrote about that, of course. Yeah. It's one of my favorite passages out of Clausewitz, the part where you walk from the rear up to the front line and, and observe the psychological effects. But, um, and, and so she, she asks, how, how can we help our generals manage this strain to reduce the irrational decisions they make? And I'd actually broaden that out. I mean. Uh, are there things that we can do to help our national leaders um, deal with this? I mean, I think about Lyndon Johnson and the Vietnam War. I mean, and he was just, you know, all but destroyed personally, but I, I, not, not just politically, he was all but destroyed personally by the strain of that war. Is there anything we can do to, you know, sort of help this? And because bad decisions get made when you're under strain. Under they absolutely do. Um, so that really is the job of, uh, 
of a senior appointee making sure that he's got staffers that really bring to him options that are viable. What has happened in numerous circumstances are that as things become more contentious, more secret or more contentious, the decision-making circle closes in, fewer people involved. Therefore, they're, they're less likely to bring in alternative views. They owe it to their own decision-making to broaden those views and understand it's not the compromise of the information. Instead, it's making sure you bring enough people into an issue to understand. And I've seen issues where because of the secret nature of the material, fewer and fewer people know what's happening and they leave out so much. Um, so those psychological pressures are absolutely real. And the best way to do it is by widening the circle, not closing it down. Not an easy matter, not an easy matter at all. Um, I'm gonna riff a little bit on a question from um, Elijah here. Um, uh, who asked if it's possible to plan, plan a war when there's so many sort of quickly changing dynamics uh, during, the, during the conflict and that what may have been sensible strategy on day one by year five might not be so sensible. Um, and I guess I wonder to, to what extent it is, is what you're proposing sort of about um, or, or what you're discussing about coming up with good objectives and thinking in a logical way through your desired end state and how plausible is it and how much of it is really about a process. I forget who it was who supposedly said this, but you know, the plan is nothing, um, planning right. is everything. And I wonder right. if that, that was Eisenhower. And that was, thank you, yeah. yes. Um, is, there, is there an aspect of this here that, this, that, 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 that having a, a process um, might be useful as opposed to a vision or a plan per se? So I, I think that's an excellent point. There's a wonderful article by Dick Betts, Richard Betts uh, at Columbia, which is, is strategy an illusion? And he talks about the whole notion of, is strategy is fake? Can we really do this? Or is it in fact, because of the kind of psychological and other issues you've, you've already brought up, can we really do this? And this would be a continuation of that. Is it just an illusion to talk about being up the plan? But think about what the options are, the options <laughs> are hideous. They are, well, let's just go into it and hope it comes out okay. We'll worry about whatever later, whether it's Ronald Reagan or anybody else saying it. So I don't think we really have an honest choice. As confusing, difficult as it is, I think we have to do the best job we can to try to sketch out what goes into it. And as you said, to set up a process so as the situation evolves, we're in front of it. And by the way, that happened to a degree in the Second World War. There were groups already studying how we were going to occupy Germany and how that was supposed to work. That was not just a, the war's ended, now let's set it up. They had been working on it for a very long time. If I could ask a question of, of my own here at this point, um, what's the range of military operations that you're talking about here? You're, you're, you're giving us a very skeptical and a very persuasive argument that you know, major war is a really bad idea. Um, you know, how far down the scale would you go? You know, is, uh, you know, Bill Clinton was famous for, you know, liking to lob cruise missiles uh, for various ways. Does that get us into these same sorts of problems? Is a, is a, is a Grenada, um, you know, um, something that plausibly we might have, you know, come to a good end at, planned our way out of, um, because it was very different scale from yes. World War II, um, or you know, even for that matter, Iraqi freedom, um, or does this really apply to all state applications of international violence? So I think it does apply, but I think there is a, there's a point to scale. Yeah, you know, there's that famous Stalin line of uh, quantity has a quality all its own. Something that's really big can be a lot harder. And I, so there's absolutely something to that. But at what point do things tip that you don't know? So when if we think about when the famous Obama red line on chemical weapon use in Syria was made, could we have really struck the Syrians and then say, ah, that's it, we're out of there. We're just gonna do one thing. It's a bit hard for me to imagine. I think that's why one of the reasons there was not an attack, why we did not strike the Syrians because it was, it was a potential morass. So at what point can you draw a line and say, I think I'm safe to do this. Um, I think that's getting, that line is moving all the time. 
to smaller and smaller actions. Um, so I, I, yes, there are probably still some bound where the two cruise missiles or whatever it gets things, certain things done, may not accomplish much, but we can do it. But I think that it's, it's getting to the point, especially with cyber retaliation by cyber, retaliation with weapons of mass destruction, it's getting harder and harder to do. We've got time for just one more question here. Um, and I've got a, an, a, an embarrassment of riches to choose from, uh, but I will take Barbara's question or a version of Barbara's question. Uh, and you were just now talking about how it would be useful, it would be helpful to sort of broaden out uh, the community of, of people involved in thinking about this and contributing. Uh, Barbara, what asks, so what happens if the leader doesn't want additional outside views? And I guess I'd, I'd sort of add, you know, um, perhaps more pessimistically, is it realistic to expect that leaders are going to want additional outside views? I don't think they'll want them in the middle, in the, the midst of a crisis. The question is, can we, in the future, prepare leaders, broaden their cognitive predispositions, their understanding of how things work ahead of time? And I, to understand, we really need to think about how the world will end. So it's not simply a matter of, I will worry about the island later, or we'll deal with that later. Um, and I think that's doable. So could they, could they, could that make a difference? I think it can. Uh, I'm not optimistic about it. I'm not gonna say I, I think everything's solvable, but I think that these issues can be boiled, that can be studied in depth and then boiled down to the point that leaders can be cued to look for things and think about them ahead of time, not at the last moment. I I'm always remember what happened at the very end of the first Gulf War when um, the Iraqis asked whether they could fly helicopters or with that part of the no-fly zone. And without thinking about it, Norman Schwarzkopf's negotiators and he said, yes, of course, that resulted in the absolute crushing of the insurgency in the South. What we need are people that think more broadly. That can occur by professional military education, but for that to occur, they have to have the material. And that's why there really is a role for academics to think through this and provide the material ahead of time. Well, uh, Bob, your comments have not been tremendously uplifting, but they have been tremendously interesting uh, and given uh, all of us, I think, a lot to chew on. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, one, or one or two quick notes uh, for everyone in attendance. You were uh, referring to uh, a book chapter, I think, by Wick Murray, if I recall correctly. Um, we, we will be able to send that out to anybody who attended who's on a JHU email address. Going farther than that, I think we run into copyright difficulties. But if you're here from with a JHU email address, we'll be able to send that out to you in a few days. And also, I believe, um, and Tasha, if she's listening, can correct me on this, but I believe that also because a couple of you have asked that a version of this and, uh, will be showing up on YouTube in good course. If you want, like me, to go back and pick up the pearls of wisdom that you didn't catch the first time from Bob. So again, thank you, Bob, so much. This has been really terrific. Bye -bye. And uh, thank you all for coming. And we hope to see all of you at a future event. Have a good evening. Thank you.